Welcome here. Here we are at workshop number five. Uh, again, thank you all so much for your generosity of your time and all your efforts over the last year, year and a year plus, actually. So uh, today we're talking about funding, and uh, I'm not going to take much time uh, here. So I'm going to turn it back or turn it over to Holly, and she's going to lead us through the process. So Holly, great, thanks. Welcome, everybody. Uh, why don't actually, before we get started, um, for folks who are not uh, on the IPRTF, I'd love it if we took a minute for you to introduce yourselves. So again, I'm Holly O'Neill. I'm the facilitator for the process. Is there anybody here who's not in the IPRTF who would, or who, you know, names that other folks don't recognize that they'd like to get acquainted? Yeah, I'm Chris Kopish. I'm with Unity Care Northwest. Great. Welcome, Chris. Glad, could, glad you could make it. I'm Dean White. I'm um, a special projects manager in the health department. Terrific. Great. Glad you could come, Dean. Anybody else? Um, Jake, were you here before and I just don't remember? Hi there. Yeah, I was here, uh, I think, the last session. Um, yep. Working, I work in district court probation, working on our side with Bruce Van Gelabt, who's uh, out of town currently. So I'm joining you. Let's see what I can do. Great. When I see your face, I remember. Great. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? All right. So welcome, everybody. So glad you could make it. And we're going to start actually with a land acknowledgement. And Jack, uh, I'll have Kathy pull up the slides and you could, if you could do us the honors, please. Sure. So before we begin, we acknowledge we are gathered on the traditional and unceded territory of the Lummi, Nooksack, Samish, and Semiamu people who have cared for and tended this land since time immemorial. Truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connection across all barriers of heritage and difference. We begin this effort to acknowledge what has been buried by honoring the truth. We pay respect to their elders, past and present. So please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together here today. And please join us in uncovering such truths at any and all public events. Thank you so much, Jack. Appreciate that. Okay, well, let's jump in then. Uh, I want to start by just thanking uh, the folks who have come in as attendees to observe today. So Mike and Robert, thank you for being here. And for you and for everybody in the call, if you have thoughts at any point, please go ahead and send us an email. The email is right there on the screen. And then that really helps us make sure that the implementation plan that we're developing is as much as possible addressing people's concerns and integrating people's ideas. So this is in concept our last workshop. We shall see, as, as you know, if you've worked with us for the last year and a bit, the, the process is always evolving, but but we're, we're narrowing it down here. So here we go. Here, I would like to go through the agenda for today, which is on the next slide. And we're going to, I'm going to just give an overview of kind of where we are in our overall process. Marty is going to pick it up and talk about the poll results, which you may not have time had time to look at, but uh, those were emailed to you earlier, and she's Marty's got a nice summary of those. So we'll talk about those and kind of get a sense of, of um, what the priorities that are emerging uh, might look like. And then we'll move into talking about the funding op options and opportunities. And Tyler is going to help us with that. And I think uh, Kayla as well. And then we'll we'll just talk about the next step. So that's the agenda for the day. Any questions? Okay, great. I want to move then right into a little reminder of our guidelines for participation. I'm putting this at the front this time. And uh, uh, so these you'll be very familiar with. It is important that you raise hands to be recognized to speak. And so you can either, you know, it's helpful to use the raise hand button and then remember to take the button down after I've called on you. Uh, or though I'm also scanning. So if your camera is on, I can often just see you on the screen. 
but it, it is helpful if you use your raise hand button. The, uh, the, the second part of this first sentence is really important. It, you know, when, <laughs> when I end one of these meetings, the first question I ask myself is, did everybody really have a chance to speak? Because the, the value of our workshops is so much higher when everybody contributes. It, it really is. If we only have two or three people talking, that's, that's just not as valuable as if everybody chimes in. And so I really encourage for all of you who are newer to the process or who tend to be a little bit more reserved to just step forward because you don't, you don't have to have it right. You don't have to have it perfect, but it really makes a difference to hear your voice. Uh, next, so that's my request. And sometimes I may call on you to help reinforce that. I'm still on the, the ground rules slide. Thanks, Kathy. Time is fleeting. I'll speed up. Uh, so extra examples are usually not that helpful. So just try and stay at the right level, which actually in all these workshops, you guys have done a great job of that, focusing on what we need to do. And re just remember that all this stuff is overlapping. So in our analysis that we've been doing on the back end, we're really looking for those points of leverage in which the facilities, the services and the systems are kind of where, where there's points at which we can have the greatest impact. And that's kind of the heart of what we're talking about today is where can we have the greatest impact and how are we gonna fund that so that we can really make some changes in these next one to three years. That's the, that's the whole idea behind the implementation planning. Okay, now we're on to the next slide. So as a reminder that our scope of work for this process, these workshops, and, and then the other pieces is all about how to um, take what was gained from the needs assessment that we just completed and then figure out what do we do now in the next one to three years to move things forward. So actions and projects, and again, we're trying to look at a one to three year time frame, even though some of those things won't be accomplished in one to three years, right? At least they will we will be getting a good a good head start on them. Next slide. This is just a reminder. Uh, the systems, uh, services and facilities. And for this work, we have split out the community based facilities and the jail and accessory uh, units facilities. So we've got them all together now today. Next slide. We are here on April 20, uh, April 12th. And you can see our process so far. So for some of you, I think most of you have been here for at least one other workshop or were part of the SAC. So I think this should go pretty smoothly. And I want to give you on our next slide a little overview of the process as a whole. So after uh, one more slide. Thanks. So after today, uh, which is this the the last of our workshops, again, in concept, we need to may need to bring people back together for something, but we haven't figured that out yet. Uh, we're going to be moving into gathering more public input. So we have the focus groups uh, with diverse communities and we have a town hall. We're going to get input from that, uh, revise and refine what the implementation plan projects or actions will be, uh, come up with a final draft, get it approved by council. Uh, then it will be given to the county executive to lead the implementation, of course, with key partners, which is all of you in the room. And uh, then over the course of implementing, we will uh, need to be coordinating, we'll need to be communicating. And I think that's gonna be really the key to success as I'm sure you all uh, know intuitively that that's what needs to change. We need to coordinate and communicate more effectively so that we can get this stuff off the ground. And then uh, basically the concept is that this planning process will be like in three year cycles and we'll come back. We'll look at the needs assessment. We'll look at what we've accomplished. We'll look at what changed. We'll look at the new funding opportunities and we'll, we'll just keep on moving, kind of cycling it through and moving it forward like a wheel. So that's, that's the basic concept of the planning process as a whole. Okay, you got it? Wonderful. The plan, I want to say one other thing, the plan doesn't have to be perfect. It has to be something that we can act on and coordinate around. It doesn't have to be perfect. So as we do this, just remember there's, I've, I do strategic planning for a living. There is never a perfect plan. 
there's only a plan that actually can help you move. If it helps you move, it's a good plan. And that's what we're aiming for. So on that note, should we do the findings from the polls? This is so exciting. Okay, Marty, okay, take it away. Let's do it. So um, very nice to see you all here today. Um, thank you for showing up. And thanks to all of you who completed the first poll. I'm gonna show some summary slides of the poll results. But before I do that, I just wanna reiterate the disclaimer that was at the top of the potential implementation projects that the poll question, you know, that this poll was about the document that you got. And then um, I said right at the top, this is a first attempt. It's a first attempt to distill what's come out of the workshops and the worksheets. And we expect that this list is going to change as we talk today and as we move forward and get public input. And through this iterative process, we're going to involve evolve our, our list a bit. But we wanted to do this first list, first poll, test it out and see where we are. So that's what I'm presenting about today. And um, uh, uh, let me just say a few things about that last slide, Kathy. The um, This is a quick overview of who responded to the survey. So it was sent out, or the poll, it was sent out to all IPRTF members, all others who attended a workshop, and all the SAC members as well. And so the, the 28 people who answered the questions were all people who've been paying attention to this work and have expertise in these topics. And most had participated in at least one of these implementation planning workshops as well. There were three people who only entered their name, their organization, and how many workshops they attended. So I took them out of the analysis. So the, um, this, the results that I'm presenting are gonna be based on 28 people who filled out the, the survey. Okay, so now on to that next one. And I'm assuming that you um, you got the results in your packets before the meeting last Friday. And so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about the details in the results. We really wanna hear from you. And two questions we'll just ask after each little section are, where do we have the potential to make the biggest impact? And where could we get some leverage? So keep those in your mind as we as we look at these next slides. Um, if you click to this next chart, this uh, there are five charts, and they go through each section of the draft potential implementation projects document. The first section is behavioral health services, and all five of the charts are set up the same way. So I'm just going to orient you quickly to this. The first column lists the potential projects or actions that were in the document. The, the actions are listed here on the slide in order of percentage of responses from the most to the least. And that is not the same order as in the document. The, um, okay, so the first, that's the first column, the, then, this chart combines responses to multiple questions. And so this second column summarizes responses to the question, questions that were asked of each item. The question was, how important are these projects to addressing critical needs in the next one to three years? And the scale was very important, important, somewhat important, not at all important, and don't know. So what you see here is a combined percentage of very important and important. Then if you go to the third column, that is um, a summary of responses to the question, how feasible do you think it will be to advance these projects? And that scale was feasible, somewhat feasible, not very feasible and impossible. And so I've combined the first two feasible and somewhat feasible. And that's the percentages you're seeing in the third column. So when you look at these behavioral health services that we had on our list, and you look at these percentages, and you think about, you know, just what you know, let's go to those two questions that are, where do we have the potential to make the biggest impact? And where could we get some leverage? 
Okay. And this is open now for, for you. And then we'll go through the other four charts, the other four sections of the document next. But we just want to hear from you uh, any reflections you have between each, about each one. Okay, you guys got it where we are? We're going to take each each of these and we just love some feedback because we can look at how important, uh, you know, there's pretty good scores on all these and feasibility. So now the question is, where do you think that just from your perspective, when you look at the behavioral health services, where do you think we can make the biggest impact and where do you see points of leverage? Yeah, go ahead, Arlene. Thank you. And I think... I'm concerned about the way that this is being framed. Um, that is, um, the way I see these items that you have here, with the exception of the last one, mm -hmm. is that they have to work together and uh, we need them all. And if we leave out any of those, we will not be doing our job properly and we will have another gap in our system. I mean, I know we'll always have some, but the major ones need to be taken care of at the same time. Mm -hmm. So even if you establish that one is more important than the other, it, we still need them in tandem together. And even if it's a very difficult process to do as many things as this at once, we must do that anyways uh, in order to do it properly. Uh, I'd like to say something about the way that things are named. When it comes to the uh, fourth item, build 23 hour crisis relief center, I would not name it in that manner. Mm -hmm. I would name it um, a 24 seven, Behavioral Health Urgent Care Center. The reason I think that those words matter is because urgent care is something that the public completely understands and accepts in the medical in the medical uh, area. So if we name it that, they they will understand what kind of system and care they they could be getting. A crisis relief center is not as clear. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's great feedback. And to your point, Arlene, I, I, I think that's a totally valid comment, right? Like we need to do all these things. I have the same feeling when I look at this list. And so that's why the questions, when we surveyed, when we polled people, what you see for all of these is pretty high, le very high levels of importance and a pretty good sense that they're feasible, which means that we've, we've done good work so far. That's why the questions I'd like you to lean into or what I'd suggest um, or where do you see leverage points and where do you see like, you know, from, it's almost like from the public's perspective, where do you think we can really make some impact as well as your sense of where we're going to, you know, sequencing <laughs> could be a thing. Um, so your point is well taken and even comments about how things are phrased can be helpful. So remember, the goal here is to move things forward, right? And I hear what you're saying, point well taken. We need We need all these things. Yeah. So noted. Okay, Michael, you're next. Oh, first, I really like um, Arlene's comment about urgent care center. I, I agree with that observation. And I want to take Arlene's observation and flip it the other way around positive. The, the, the significant overlap here is exactly why I think it'll be easier to fund them. There'll be a lot of two for one, three for one, four for one kind of payoffs for the efforts. So um, I'm viewing their overlap as exactly why they make a coherent story that deserves funding and they will work together. It's work, you know, so um, she's right, but I think we could flip that and, and have it be exactly why it, we should do them in a coordinated fashion. Great. Thank you so much. Dan? Yeah, I just want to point out that um, Senate Bill 5536 uh, passed the House last night. And that basically, it's it's coming down to uh, recriminalizing um, hard drugs like fentanyl, which is a scourge in our community, and uh, we're seeing a massive amount of um, overdose o overdoses, unlike anything we've seen uh, in the past several years. So I think all of these things are important, 
And your question about leveraging, I guess I want, wanted to get some clarity around that. If leveraging means, you know, can we get additional state dollars if we have some kind of, you know, ballot measure here that is successful that provides you know, essentially seed money, uh, similar to the Bellingham Home Fund? Um, are we? Are you asking if we think that uh, state dollars could then become available for, say, capital facility um, projects or ongoing um, operational um, needs? Is that is that the question that you're asking? I was using the the question leveraging in an open way. So however you interpret that, it would be great. So so from a funding perspective, from a sequencing perspective, or um, just because two things when packaged together, make it stronger, for example. Those are all ways you could think about leveraging. So Dan, how would you answer the question? Do you see points of leverage here? I do. I, I think that if there's uh, support uh, from the community for this measure, if it um, then I think that we have the possibility to um, lobby our state representatives and federal too. Let's not forget our federal uh, partners on this because that's where the real dollars are at. Um, then I think that we could uh, make some gains in um, the the facility uh, approach, the 23-hour facility, the sobering center, whatever we're calling that, uh, as well as operational funds for uh, the very expensive and, and very ongoing operational funds for behavioral health services, including up to and including the programs that have been uh, discussed, LEAD, GRACE, ART, uh, MCOT, and the PAC program, and, and, and many others. Great. Thank you. Okay, Perry, you're up. Afternoon, folks. Um, I just wanted to uh, do some clarification. I had actually communicated with Marty as she was developing uh, the documents and um, had actually recommended the use of the term 23-hour uh, crisis relief center as it's consistent with the legislation. Um, and I think that there's it's a problem as far as urgent care um, that can lean into what we know as uh, primary medical um, urgent care facilities. And so respectfully, um, my uh, goal in that was to uh, clarify language, uh, particularly language that was used by legislation. And as an example, we talk about uh, sometimes I'm being substance uh, um, or uh, 24 hours, uh, 23 hour sobering centers. Um, this is not limited to um, SC. Uh, but is open to behavioral health services. And so um, I offer that piece of information. Great. Thanks, Perry. Chris? Yeah, I was actually going to say something along the lines of what Perry said. Um, you know, Unity Care is working with um, Whatcom County, the OC, and Peace Health on this program that you may have heard of called the Waystation. And we're considering how what services we provide is we're going to provide um, clinically and considered calling it urgent care. And we really um, pulled back from that because there's there are some um, ex expectations when you use that term. I don't, you know, uh, that so you don't want people thinking they can come in um, with, you know, wounds or, you know, that need to be seen, you know, urgently. So I do think that, that, that I agree. I think the language should matter and match expectations, but just be cautious about that. And also the um, congressional, we've also received considerable funding from, there's, an, there's um, I think this is what um, Dan was referring to, they've revamped the uh, federal appropriations process and it's an annual primarily capital process. Uh, I think there might be some availability for program, but what I have seen is mostly capital, um, which can be considerable funding um, from our, um, our, our Congress people here in, in, in Whatcom County and um, the state as well. That's really helpful. It's helpful to, uh, I mean, I'm noticing a lot that how we call things, what what we name things is going to have an impact on people's support and, and understanding and also funding. So we don't have to figure it out today, how we're going to call things. But I think if you notice something, that's really helpful to name that today. Perry, did you have another comment or did to share? Perry? Okay, I'm going to shift to Tyler and remember to put down your hands when you're done. So Tyler, did you have a? Oh yeah, thanks Holly. Um, I was just going to kind of build off of um, Arlene and, and Michael's point a little bit, just recognizing that the top four of those are, are close to 90% of important and feasible um, and, and how they really do blend together um, from a, a system-wide standpoint. Um, and then also kind of to the leverage conversation, I would recognize that to build a, 
a 23 hour crisis relief or or crisis care center that they're calling it in in North King County um, is really a, a point of leverage um, for an immediate action um, because the the legislature is close to hopefully knock on wood allocate nine million dollars um, for that type of facility if that's in the house budget that seems like a very good leverage point associated with that type of facility and then also um, to what Perry was referring to. Um, Senate Bill 5120 um, is specifically to talk about the operations and um, statewide significance of these types of facilities. So I think there's a lot of um, motivation to help establish operational funding um, for the facilities. There, there's capital money from the state that we can leverage. Um, and I just wanted to kind of try to answer or provide some perspective on that um, for the that, that crisis relief, behavioral health, urgent care, whatever we decide to call it moving forward, I think it'll be a, a point of leverage that we can um, respond to. Fantastic. Great. Thank you, Tyler. Okay. So everybody else, if you have, we're going to, we have five of these to go through. So if you have more comments, jot them down and then shoot them in an email. Okay. So let's jump to the next one. Okay. okay, so the next one, again, the chart set up the same way with how important and how feasible each of these actions is, and these are related to working with state partners, their advocacy efforts primarily or research. So um, you can see them here. The first one's about the Medicaid waiver, which we've talked about a bit in these workshops. Then there's inpatient competency restoration not to be confused with outpatient. And, the, and that's a regional kind of approach. And then um, also the regional secure detox facility. So where do we have potential to make the biggest impact? And where could we get some leverage? Any thoughts? Or any reflections on what you see here in, this, in these poll results? Uh, so, yeah, I was going to say this, uh, this, the very first point, allow uh, for Medicaid funds. I think this is something is, is feasible, approachable, and we should put a lot of uh, uh, efforts behind it. And it will make uh, substantial contributions, but make uh, long-term contributions. That's not something will dry out. So I, to me, this comes like that, that this is totally achievable and we should start on that. Thank you. I already have reached out to Mr. Larson on this very topic because their chief of staff was in my office last week and uh, we brought it up with them already. Fantastic. Thank you, Sir Paul. That's great. Great to hear. Anybody else on this slide on the regional and state partners for increased behavioral health services? Yeah, Dan? Yeah, I think um, I agree with Seth Paul on that first item. Um, this is super important to, to be able to have those funds to be able to treat people while they're uh, in our system. Uh, and then the second, and, and we need, also need to um, help, um, we, we need to make, make sure that the reimbursement rate is high enough uh, to make sense. And then the second point, increased access to inpatient competency restoration. I, I don't see how that's gonna be possible. We've been working on this for, for some time now. The average wait for um, for a felony charge for uh, for restoration is 321 days to go to to Western State Hospital, um, and that facility is adding capacity, but they've also closed capacity as well. And that new capacity coming online is go is going to be a few years out. That is, we have people that are are languishing in our system right now, and Chief Jones can probably speak better to this than I can. Um, that are just waiting, just waiting to get their uh, their restoration process uh, under underway. And so we we do need to work on that. I'm not quite sure how that will work, um, but if we can figure out how to have uh, inpatient beds uh, regionally, then we would be better off. I, as to your, your question about how to leverage that, I'm not quite sure how we do that. Um, is it feasible? I, I hope so, because um, it's very, very necessary. Thank you. Great. 
Chris? Oh yeah, just chiming in about the Medicaid uh, waiver. I do agree that that would be a, a very important component for a sustainable clinical program. Um, I don't know how the Medicaid waiver really functions. I think I read something that you have somebody who is monitoring that process, but it's a statewide lift. And that is an area that I think that we can have some partners um, advocate for it. I don't know if it's with CMS or with you know, the healthcare authority or, or if it has to go through a legislative process or both. But um, there are there are definitely um, advocacy groups that can help um, and, and would see benefit for this this type of waiver in their communities as well. So um, just consider building those partnerships. And I certainly can help with um, community health center um, advocacy at the state level. Great. Thank you. Barry? I think uh, maybe you're on mute, Barry. Sorry about that. Uh, on the uh, inpatient competency restoration services in a regional kind of regional thinking, mm -hmm. uh, WASAC is certainly interested in this. They've had that on their radar for a while, uh, as well as North Sound Behavioral Health. Uh, we, I've, I'm on their board. We've discussed that a, a little bit around the edges, but they're going to be going through a leadership change this summer. I'm on their uh, their uh, search committee for a new executive director. And I think that now is the time to talk to them about any any fresh ideas that we have that we want them to consider mm -hmm. at a regional basis. So I think I think that the I think your numbers are pretty good here. Eighty one, maybe a little lower. Eighty feasible because it's it's one of the ones that it's a little weaker. I agree with uh, other people's assessments, but I think it's certainly worth keeping on our radar and making sure that uh, that we're working on it. Excellent. Thank you. Erica? Thanks. Uh, just in reference to the Medicaid issue, I know this is one of uh, WASAC, Washington State Association of Counties, top priorities. And we, I know the exec's office has had conversation with them. Um, this has come up at a national level with city and county health officials. And it seems like it's this is really a ripe topic for the interim with um, Chris Kobdish talking about options for, for other advocacy efforts and other organizations statewide. So I'm really hopeful about this. I pulled the numbers of what we're spending a year um, in the jail between the Behavioral Health Fund and other funds. And I think Wendy probably has this number too, but it's over $3 million a year on, um, on health services that could be reimbursable for, um, for Medicaid that we're using local dollars. So it's significant. It would have a real impact. Wow. Great. Thank you. All right. Uh, should we move on? Next slide. Again, if you have more, go ahead and just jot it down. Address housing needs. Marty, go ahead. Yeah. So this one, um, the, the first part is about ensuring that existing supportive housing programs are adequately funded and staffed and equipped and the the following one is about expanding permanent supportive housing options. And um, then the third one is about advocating to address the 90 day rule. This is something that came up in between meetings. It is not something that the SAC talked about that I recall, and it's not something that we talked about in previous workshops. Um, this came from um, the housing uh, subject matter expert. Um, and I think it, it was pretty interesting, but you know, in the results here, 23% of people didn't really know what this was about, and that is understandable. So that um, explains the low scores. And you know, this was tacked on. Um, and I think maybe uh, I wonder if Mike is Mike Parker on the call because he has some thoughts and information about this. Uh, let me see. I think Mike's on the attendee list. Maybe if he gets promoted. Um, is it possible to promote Mike? Oh, yeah. He's got talking permitted. In fact, Mike, do you want to reply? Where'd you go? There you are. I'm sorry, Holly. I, I was just I, a little bit distracted for the um, moment. Can yeah. you ask the question again? No, the yeah. other Mike. Other Mike. Mike Parker. <laughs> oh, thank you, Mike Hilly, for being so on top of it. Right on. <laughs> really? You just heard Mike. And, 
jumped on can, the mic. I just want to know though, can Mike can Mike Kelly get a, a promotion too? Because I think he deserves a promotion. <laughs> it was thank you for my promotion. Marty, were you talking about the uh, the 90 day rule under the I uh, am I am talking about the 90 day rule and just wondering if you want to say anything about that part as sure. um, as we move into discussion of these items. Yeah. Sure. I'm I'm not sure who who brought it up, but Marty, the document you showed me was talking about a a HUD rule that's kind of embedded in the definition of what is chronically homeless. And why that's really an important point is obviously there are certain federal fundings that are available and must serve people that are chronically homeless. So that's kind of the crux of the issue. 90 days, um, since I'm not an expert in that, I went to the folks who run coordinated entry over at Opportunity Council where I work. And what, you know, 90 days is not uh, a deal killer, so to speak. It, it, it can interrupt somebody's chronic homeless status and it makes it difficult, but it in, in, in and of itself will not prevent somebody from accessing those funds. It may delay it, it may make it more complicated, but it's not a deal breaker. So um, yeah, that's just a little perspective on it. So is it problematic? Yes. It's also been there since 2015. Um, it's survived a lot of administrations and um, we don't see at least in national advocacy partners a real push to deal with this because there's so many people that qualify in our community and in communities around the country that they just really haven't pushed to have this, this rule done. So I also just want to briefly comment, even though that's what Marty didn't ask, but I think the other two points are so well stated and it's really, you know, if we're going to advocate for something, as Dan said, where the money is in the federal area. And we need federal support to get housing for people that are criminal um, legal system involved. Um, I think that's really, really crucial. So I love the other two points under advocacy. And I think in terms of leverage, um, this has leverage points, right? We have local resources, local capabilities in this area. Um, and I think it directly gets at the heart of the issue because we've seen when folks are housed, they offend less. When folks are housed and have jobs, there's less challenges. So I, I just wanna really echo strong support for the other ones. I don't know that we'd get a lot of traction on the 90 day rule. And as long as I'm understanding uh, why it was put there and what, what aspect of the 90 day rule, essentially when a person spends that 91st day in jail, it becomes an interruption in their chronic homeless status. And then we have to go through some hoops to get them, re, to get them recertified. Is that, yeah, Marty, did that yes, kind of cover that? I think the the concern is if people hit that 90 day, go over 90 days, they lose their chronic homeless status, then they're released from jail, and then they can't get into some programs because they don't qualify until they've spent time on the street again, at which point they can relapse in any number of ways. Um, and, so that and, was the concern. And certainly a risk there, and that can happen. You know, it changes documenting, like if somebody was contiguous and we were trying to qualify them that way, they had 12 months straight, that would then at that point constitute a break. And so then you have to document so many breaks over so many years. It gets in the weeds very quickly, but folks are pretty adept at working around it, but you're right, it, it causes a barrier. And at that exact moment, it's a big barrier. And it doesn't mean it's not surmountable at some point, but it is problematic at that point. That's really helpful. Okay. Thanks, Mike. And Wendy, I bet you have some good uh, perspective on this one too. Can't hear you. I, I think you got to unmute. I think I have it down by now. Um, I agree with the things Mike was saying, but there's something else to roll into this is that especially under Section 8 housing, if you've been involved in the criminal justice system, especially if you've been incarcerated at a felony, you can lose all eligibility to participate in those programs. And so despite the fact there may have been a lot of reasons why you wound up in jail or prison, the ability to get housing when you've completed your sentence is significantly reduced for some people. Mm -hmm. And it just occurred to me when uh, Mike Parker was talking. So, so is that part of the ninety-day rule too? That no, you... it's a separate rule under Section Eight housing, which is HUD. So it's a federal program. Yeah, Wendy is exactly right. There are multiple barriers that being involved in the criminal legal system have with people trying to get housing when they get jobs and they've completed their sentence and trying to re-enter the community. There are several blockades, and some of them 
you know, such as methamphetamine production in your record, you're barred permanently, is my understanding from, from public housing. There aren't many rules like that that are like permanent barment forever, but boy, it just makes it makes a difficult um, application process and trying to get somebody eligible for housing, it makes it even harder. And they're kind of very troublesome barrier. So Wendy's exactly right. And poor credit is another one that's held against folks, right, that have been in, in, the, in our criminal legal system. So there are many, uh, many issues surrounding that. So I guess one of the questions is whether to try to take on uh, one or more of these rules. And we could make this particular item broader. So it's about trying to address those rules that prevent people from having very smooth um, at, at, um, exit from jail and straight into housing, something like that. Um, or just realize that most people who are involved with the criminal legal system and have behavioral health issues and have been homeless could be and or have been homeless could benefit from permanent supportive housing services. And the most important thing to do is to beef up the system for the majority of people who are not necessarily gonna be impacted by those rules, but just try and get our current services well-supported and expand those services. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So should we, have a, should we have something about rules here and addressing rules or not? Let's let's put for right now, let's put a pin on that topic. I think it's a great topic to dig into more with maybe some other um, housing folks. Uh, but I'm kind of feeling like we should move on because it's, it's a big topic. Yep. OK, so let's do jump to the next one then. The next one is about the um, build a new jail and accessory services. And um, so I think the the jail one is pretty clear the behavioral care center maybe there was a little bit more um, uncertainty mm -hmm. still pretty high percents um, but uncertainty about the feasibility anybody want to speak to to potential impacts or um, where we could get some leverage here yeah michael unfortunately i was too busy to um respond to the poll and I, I would have ranked the behavioral hair care center very high. Um, I think based on how people responded to the, the last effort to build a jail, this is the critical piece or pieces like this are exactly what we're missing. So I would say the feasibility and the viability of the jail is actually dependent upon behavioral health care center, maybe a secure one, a jail like alternative. I think it's exactly the key ingredient that gets this widespread support. It makes everything else about the jail feasible. Thank you. Barry? Yeah, I, I, I love the last piece Michael just said. I, I agree they need to be partners, uh, those two facilities. Uh, I, I question the, you know, the, low, the lower feasibility rating um, because I, I don't quite understand what logic someone would have to say it's not feasible. I would love to have that discussion. I think maybe a better and more thorough explanation of what this is might help people see that it's not a big pie in the sky dream. It, it is something that it's actually probably pretty feasible, so. Yeah, thank you, Barry. Let's hear from Doug. And then if anybody did rank this as a lower feasibility, maybe you could just tell us your, your thinking there. Uh, Doug? Yeah, I think as far as the behavioral care center goes, I think it uh, it is feasible, and I think we saw a very good example of that in Nashville. I mean, um, at the point of construction, it's very easy to do that, and it's it's essentially provides a diversion, an in custody diversion for people once they're uh, have been booked in to make a decision if they want to um, go through some short term. Uh, treatment program in an in custody setting, and the people that we talked to in that in that setting were very appreciative of the opportunity, and um, it was really designed for uh, their success. And, and they seem to be flourishing in that environment. So, um, like I said, I, I I think it is very doable um, to to have those essentially co located at the same location. And uh, once they're in the door, they they have the opportunity to make that decision in their best interest. 
Thank you. So, Paul? I thought the feasibility is very high because <clears throat> we are talked about having behavioral health, mental health beds in the jail. So, you know, th this is kind of synonymous with them. It's more like how we actually implement it, in what way, and what, uh, how many beds we allocate. Uh, you know, so I, to me, it's pretty high feasibility in our current plan, we have been discussing 40, 50, 60 beds could be part of this, uh, this uh, thinking. Thank you. Thank you. Caleb? Thanks. I would like to say that if anybody would like more detail on the breadth and scope of this kind of uh, a facility, I'd be happy to uh, facilitate that discussion. Um, the thing that I think is important to recognize is that co-location for a facility like a behavioral care center with uh, the, the jail is very, very important because you can shorten the gap in uh, you know, access. Um, access becomes really, really crucial because this is truly like uh, one of the highest forms of, of true diversion that we could have in our area. Um, literally being uh, uh, preventing people from being in, involved in the justice system to begin to begin with is foundational to this entire discussion. And so having a, a space, a facility that we can dedicate resources to where literally people are just diverted out of, um, you know, essentially a full custody scenario and they're not even pre presented to um, a judge is really, really important for reducing recidivism, impact in those people's lives. And so again, I would I would say that they need to be co-located um, and I think it's very feasible to do so. And the other thing is, is again, if anybody's interested, I can speak more uh, to the way that this sh could be structured and how it would work. Great, thank you, Caleb. That might be really helpful. So we'll find out if, yeah, people might be interested. Uh, Arlene. Yeah, it seems to me that until we create a system where uh, people with mental health problems don't ever get into the jail, only in a tiny exception, until that happens, this is, a, this is something we need for the time being. And all of this is related to the fact that we lost many years ago uh, long-term care, mental health care, uh, for people who couldn't cope on the outside and and um, uh, end up uh, committing crimes. So it's part of a, a, a changing approach to uh, mental health and to crime, both. Thank you. Boy, the, these last few comments you all have made, this whole section, just you you've the way you're phrasing things, I think is just really really makes sense. It feels really resonant with what both, you know, like what's true and also what we need to be communicating to our communicate to, to our community. Finish that sentence. Yeah. Go ahead, Brian. I just wanted to say that um, I think what, even though I have a great deal of support for both of these items, I think what I got hung up on was uh, really just the wording attached. I started to think about the location um, if it's as maybe Caleb was suggesting, it's within the facility, that uh, is much easier for me to, to, to understand. But I started thinking about the locations that, that I assume we're in, or, or that we talked about last week, and that attached part got me wondering about physical space, physical location. Yeah, great. Well, and that's what we're going to talk about next too, Brian. So you're, you're setting us up well here. Thank you. All right, let's... Uh, Let's move on. Next slide. Yep. Okay. So this is the last one of these charts um, that's looking at importance and feasibility, and it's about collecting data and developing a data dashboard. The data dashboard was 100% feasible. That was great to see. And um, the other percentages are high. I don't know if anybody wants to comment on this. It, um, seems like one of those things that crosses all of the recommendations that we had in the needs assessment. And um, 
the importance and feasibilities are right up there. So feels like feels like we've talked about this one a lot over the the whole SAC process and beyond uh, and into this implementation and maybe we're good there. Any any thoughts? All right, let's move on to the next part. Oh, I I, I just oh, sorry, sorry. wanted to add that uh, we had discussed uh, uh, this thing before that uh, a data mining and a data analyst. So, and I came to this uh, body of people and said that we'll work towards that. So I am gathering that information. I wanna take it to the council sometime soon uh, to, to at least start process on that. It is very, very important for us, and then it should be long term, not for first few. So it may take a little time, but that's how we will get confidence from people. If we can collect the data and share whatever it is, share with people. Thank you. Thank you. I think also, Sat Paul, honestly, that why people are seeing it as feasible because you're so clearly like, we got to do it, we're going to do it. And uh, I think that your your uh, dedication to this one, it matches with the groups and it makes it more feasible. So thank you for that. Okay, are we ready? Should we do the next one? Yeah, the next one is a question. Um, Kathy, are you? Yep, there you are. Um, so this is just asking as you as you looked over the document and as you've now reflected on the the poll results. Do you see any big gaps in what we should be thinking about in this implementation plan? Is there anything we haven't really covered in some way or another? They, and remember that that isn't, we're not throwing it all the way open with that question. We are tie, staying tied to the needs assessment recommendations. So is there anything related, any actions or projects related to those recommendations that we really haven't addressed in some way or another with these initial implementation plan projects. Raylene? Thank you. The one thing I see missing is transportation. Um, we have a mobile crisis outreach um, team that can go out, but um, it's limited to um, certain areas, certain abilities, if there's um, too many crises going on, it's not going to be able to um, reach every small city, every location in the county. And as people have crisis, mental health crisis, a lot of them live in rural areas of Whatcom County, um, and they have no transportation to get to the locations, um, to get the treatment, to get the housing. Um, as they live in rural areas. So I think making sure as we move forward to looking at locations, we wanna also remember that we are trying to prevent people from being incarcerated. And a step doing that is making sure that individuals have adequate transportation to their crisis needs. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, Heather? Um, what I would love to see is the timeline and who is responsible, kind of who's going to do what by when to actually make this implementation plan happen. That will be part of the, the implementation plan. I think we we're just, that will, that will definitely be part of it. Just needed to try to figure out what the, this is the first part. <laughs> what are okay. those? projects or actions. Although Thank I want to I want to pause right here um Heather with to see if you have a suggestion because if you remember in the worksheets we asked that question like where do you in your organization see being involved and we got very uh, almost non-existent response. So I'm going to put the question to you if we're going to try and articulate who the partners are or where leadership lies do you have a suggestion from a process standpoint on how to how to ascertain that? Oh, I think that's it's really interesting to hear that that there was very little. Yes, I can take that on, but I'm not sure. I think that's a great question for the whole group. What would help us understand what does it mean to say yes to taking on this responsibility? What does it mean to be the lead? 
And I think by default, I have been assuming that the county administration and leadership internal to the county would do all of this, but I'm not sure that's an accurate assumption. And my concern is just generally Whatcom County, all of us, all of our organizations are so good at making beautiful plans. And then we don't take responsibility for implementing them. So that's my fear is that if we don't assign responsibility and say, sorry to call you out, Barry, council member Barry, you are going to build an urgent care for behavioral health by May of next year, then how do we hold anyone accountable to it? So, yeah. so I think that's a great, maybe next part of a group conversation. I would be very open to that, um, having a focused question about who could take on what parts or who else is missing at the table, who needs to be involved in that conversation? Because this is an incomplete table too for all of this community work. So. so Heather, if you hold the ladder, I'll drive the nails, I'll help build it. I'm in. <laughs> okay, those were, those were helpful suggestions, Heather. Thank you so much. All right, uh, Donnell. Yes, I just wanna circle back to the Behavioral Health Care Center with yeah. regard to what Tyler said about it being attached. And I think we need to be clear on what attached means or are we talking about nearby? And what I'm getting from the community, one of the big question is who's in charge there? So is it law enforcement that's in charge there? And that's a concern. In fact, it's a fear for some people that mm -hmm. if you have a healthcare center that has the oversight by law enforcement, then what does that mean for the people that may uh, go there? Thank you. Great question. Thank you, both both of them. Yeah, Brian? Yeah, I just wanted to respond to, to Heather a little bit that I think um, we actually have lots of uh, examples of uh, more than just plans, but of actual programs that have been implemented. And I think many of those have been talked about today. Um, and I think we have the structures in place for a lot of intergovernmental work uh, to to move this forward. So um, I think we I think we do quite a bit more than just make plans. I think we have a lot of a really good track record of implementation on a on a number of fronts. So. Great, thank you, Brian. Arlene. Yes, um, I wanted to respond to what Heather said. Also, um, this has to do with transparency. The um, the the community needs to know who's doing what and um i'm willing to volunteer to work on anything and related to uh, the mental health services um i think it would be good to establish i would call it a small committee uh, of uh, the administration county administration people and um, people who have served on um, this planning process who are willing to volunteer. Um, uh, and that's because, you know, and I'm saying it this way because I wanna see it happen. I don't wanna be part of talking and planning. I wanna see the end result. Um, I wanna see the opening day. I wanna see the, the celebration and lots of, obstacles can come up in this process. So uh, can we please organize this? Boy, when you said that, Arlene, my first thought is who's gonna plan those parties? We should put that in the- Oh, I'll, I'll volunteer for that one in a, <laughs> a second. You know, I'll even cater them. I mean- <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay, I see Wendy and then Caleb and Raylene and Barry. Go ahead. Wendy, I'm just quick. If we can keep her um, comment short. That'd be good. Just a reminder to everybody that since 2006, we've had a co-located crisis respite and a corrections facility in the same building, and they were separate. That was the old triage center, which was run by by folks from both detox and from mental health, and then the other two thirds of it was jail. So it's not unprecedented in this community and it worked very well. Very rarely did the folks over at triage ask for corrections assistance. Most commonly they use Bellingham PD. 
So, and I think maybe that when the time comes, some discussion is that, that this was kind of like a trial balloon of that type of model and it's worked fairly well. And if um, the behavioral care center was on the same property in close proximity to, or even attached so that there's a door you would go through, but that the supervising entity for that behavioral uh, care center would really be the folks who were medical behavioral health and that, and that corrections would be there possibly to move people over to there or provide assistance if they need it in case something happened. Mm -hmm. But I see it because we'll need a behavioral health unit or section in the jail for people who it's not safe for the community or for other people to have them at the BCC and still, but be able to have the judges use that as an option that if they complete a 28 day treatment there, then that will take care of whatever jail time they would have gotten. Yeah. Thanks, that's helpful. Yeah, helpful clarifications. Thank you, Wendy. Caleb? So I was gonna say uh, also in response to Chief Tanksley, the, the model that we're looking at here is specifically drawn up by Nashville and it was just uh, the, the most specific thing we can call on in terms of the way that this is operated. In, in Nashville, and I'm just gonna be very quick, it is part of the jail, but it is a separate part of the jail that you can only access through a specific door. There are correction staff members who are part of the operation of it, but the decisions whether people stay in or, or uh, proceed through the whole process are behavioral health and mental health decisions only. It is not a corrections decision whether they go through the process or not. Um, the correction staff members are there to make sure that people are safe and to provide assistance with essentially security functions, um, but they are not uniform staff members. Um, and so I think that the, it's, a, it's a good model to look into um, for our area. Great. Thank you. Raylene? Thank you. I'll be careful trying not to repeat too much as a response to Tank's um, comments. I agree with Chief Tank that some people are concerned about going into behavioral health um, centers. However, I think having that co-model um, would be more beneficial as I often see um, the judges giving the option to do treatment instead of jail. Um, but a lot of times they don't stay in treatment. So having that option to keep them there is definitely beneficial. But in a world where we would have unlimited supplies of funds, um, it would be really nice to see a behavioral health sit, uh, center 24 seven outside of the jail and then one attached to the jail, um, especially for preventing criminogenic behaviors and uh, making sure that we have something available for juveniles in our area um, that's more beneficial, I think, in the future to try to keep people from being incarcerated. But um, thank you, uh, Caleb, for giving us the information on the National Center. Thank you so much, Raylene. Okay, we'll hear from Barry and then Tyler, and then we'll we'll keep moving on. Barry, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to go back to Heather's point and, and maybe add a, another couple of things to that. I think we're going to need a, a multidiscipline implementation team. I think we've kind of talked about that. But we're also, I think we're going to also need an oversight role of some sort, like the EMS Oversight Board, for instance, or that's a model. Uh, one of our biggest things we have with the community is a trust deficit. And I think if we talk about and, and, and uh, implement some sort of oversight as we go forward, I think that that does a lot to both, you know, for accountability and transparency, as well as kind of restoring some of that community trust. Yeah. Thank you, Barry. Tyler? Yeah, I'll be quick. I just wanted to recognize that um, my, myself, I was thinking through where was like recognizing the capacity of grace lead of, of alternative response of the therapeutic court programs. Um, but I, I wanted to, and, and so I was going to bring that up to the group because the therapeutic court wasn't kind of a, a specifically identified, but it is in that section about increasing capacity of effective existing programs. 
to divert people from incarceration. Um, so I just had to go through that thought process before I, I added to the group that I thought we needed to focus on therapeutic courts and others. Um, so so that's good. And then I, I um, to Barry's last comment there about oversight and understanding and, and implementation of these, um, I think that's a great idea. And I think there's there's ways built in, and I'll actually speak a little bit later on about um, some ways to build in that oversight board, because there has been some discussions um, with a, a new jail facility. How do the city and the county and the community members have some oversight associated with it? Um, and I think, you know, there is a that trust part from the past is really important to understand. As I'm starting to look at things from 20, 15, 2017 on, the crisis stabilization building has been built, the expansion of the alternative response teams, grace, lead. You know, there are a lot of ways kind of to Brian's point for us as a community to understand where we've invested in, and shown that we can accomplish those projects. So I do think there needs to be that oversight and a recognition of who to implement it. And I think we're showing a better track record lately of accomplishing that. That's nice. Thanks for saying this. Tyler, I'm thinking too about the focus groups that we have coming up and that and the town hall and just emphasizing like here's where we have made progress too. It's just I'm realizing how important that will be. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. You ready to move on to the next piece? We have a we have some juicy conversations here coming up. So here we go. Marty, uh, actually, Kathy, could you put the slide back up and yeah. we will jump into this next section. Yeah, and that was a really nice, juicy conversation we just had. Thank you all. It was. Yeah, you guys, that was Great. excellent. So, okay, I just have a few more poll results to report and then we'll move on to, to Tyler's section. So um, these are about the jail and other facilities and, and we're just trying to start getting a handle on size and location. The, the very first question is just, should a tax initiative include services to keep people out of jail as well as building a new jail? And there seems to be you know, very high agreement that yes, it should. I'm gonna move on to the next one. This is a best guess for the number of beds we would need in a jail. And um, I feel like the um, we have nearly equal percentages in the three groupings. The groupings overlapped. It, the ranges were too big. It was just not a good question. And I think we need to do this again with smaller ranges that don't overlap. So this one, I, I'd say we can't really rely on very much. It just, it, we didn't do it right. I didn't do it right. So let's skip that one. On to the next one. Um, which property is an appropriate location for each type of facility? And we were talking about five different facilities or um, functions. And um, people could check as many options for each facility as they like. That's why the numbers in any row don't add up to 100. What I did is took the first and second highest percentages for each facility location and put them in the chart, the highest percentage is in blue. So um, the 23-hour crisis relief center um, being located in Iron Gate 70 was um, what 74% of people thought should happen with if we build that facility. A new jail at La Bounty, 59% um, and 52 at Iron Gate and et cetera. And let's go on to the next one. And this is um, just people were asked to rank their first, second, and third choice locations for a jail. And so we have um, a little over half marking La Bounty as their first choice. And um, then I, I just kind of highlighted in blue there the other choices. So 68% of people marked Civic Center as their third choice. Iron Gate was pretty well, you know, I, first and second choice for, for most people. And this is where I'm going to just 
pass to Tyler here to talk a little bit more about Iron Gate and, um, and then move on from there to other topics related. Yeah, thanks, Marty. Um, so the, the planning group had asked me to all, um, provide a little background on the Iron Gate Division Street um, property and location. And I remember back to uh, last September or so um, in the Stakeholder Advisory Committee dialogue, there was talk about um, expanded campus at Iron Gate and Division. And recognizing that um, for it truly the property to be large enough to accomplish uh, a jail facility at that location, additional property would need to be acquired. Um, so um, we have had a number of conversations over the last six months or so, maybe even longer now that I look to see it to be April, um, since, since August and September, um, with property owner in, in the location of the, um, of the interim work center, which to get everybody up to date on this um, photo, the interim work center is actually the green roof right in the middle where it says Whatcom County Crisis Triage. That's actually the, the, the interim work center. The Ann Deacon Center of Hope is just north of that. That's the Ann Deacon Center of Hope. The county about two years ago acquired the vegetative piece there that's three to four acres where the cursor is currently. Um, so that what gives a campus of about 10 acres um, when, you, when you look at that. And there was, has been conversations um, to acquire another five acres in that location that the property owner is, has not been interested to date um, to um, sell that property. So that, that frames up a little bit on the viability of um, a horizontal jail facility in that location uh, becomes much less an opportunity without additional property uh, being acquired. Marty, Holly, do you think there's more to add for the, the context of that conversation? Um, well, I guess, Tyler, it, it is, is a vertical jail also out of the picture at the Iron Gate facility? You know, it's a, a good question. Um, we're going to get further down into the conversation about vertical versus horizontal. Um, and the cost estimate conversation. Um, we have had a lot of conversation about vertical in the downtown, in the Civic Center location. Um, so being able to operate the crisis stable, the Andy Can Center of Hope, operate the interim work center, which is, you know, or, or the work center and build a, a, a vertical jail at that location, then no, it would not be feasible for a vertical jail. For a vertical jail. Yeah. And then it also eliminates, I think, if we we're going to try and make it with the behavioral care center, health center. Correct. Care, right? And then as you looked at the poll results, there was a discussion in kind of um, um, the 23-hour crisis care relief center and having that somewhat co-located to the Ann Deacon Center of Hope um, provides a little bit more of a campus associated with that behavioral health response where we wanna intervene and how that gets accomplished. Got it. Okay, thank you. Arlene? Yeah, I wanted to say something about the, um, the triage center since I'm intimately familiar with that building and worked in it for nine years. And I can tell you that it's a building that is not worth keeping. Mm -hmm. um, it's like a pole building. So the quality of it and the way it's used is inefficient. It should be taken down. If you were to take it down, then the property space is very different and much larger um, possibilities. Yeah, thank you for that. Okay, Tyler, do you want to do you want to move on to the next slide, or do you want to speak any more on the Iron Gate side? Uh, no, I, if there's any questions on the Iron Gate, it's fine. Okay, so 
this is, um, I, I want to give a little context for this slide. And this is a scenario. And this was really, um, Marty and I attempted after we looked at all of the feedback from kind of what goes with where and what people prioritized, what would be one or more scenarios that could work. And so this is a scenario for discussion purposes to give us something to to kind of push against to see what resonated and what didn't. But what but just to give you a sense of where it came from, this is us looking at all the results <laughs> and trying to put something together and see how it landed. So um, Tyler's gonna, we asked Tyler to describe it and then we're gonna discuss it. So Michael, I, it's your hand, but I'm gonna have Tyler jump in and just describe first. And then-, and then First of all, did somebody just win a bet? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, mm -hmm. what maybe needs to be added to complicate the picture here is if there is indeed an insistence on locating certain services like the public defenders uh, near the jail, and for that matter, the courthouse. I mean, there's a couple other facilities or programs that may not be listed here. Um, courthouse is not moving. Um, public defenders, I suppose, could. Well, you know, there may be a few other things that need, need to be added to this to table to flesh it out. Great. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So let's jump in. Go ahead. Okay. That's good, and and, and Councilmember Lopez, your 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 points are 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 good. So I, I can try to address a little bit. Um, if Kathy, could you go back up three slides, one more, one more. So right here. So as as Holly and Marty were walking through the slides earlier, um, you look at the blue percentage, which are the highest percentage of each one. So um, the the new jail was recognizing the highest percentage was La Bounty. The, the, the 23 hour crisis relief center, highest percentage was Iron Gate. The behavioral care center, highest percentage was La Bounty. The resource center, highest percentage was Civic Center. The, the transitional holding facility, the, the highest percentage was Civic Center. So as Holly and, and Marty was kind of indicating, I get the great opportunity to, to message um, what that percentage shows in this scenario. Because if now, um, Kathy, if you can go down to the, the slide that we were just on, uh, there's four different properties that we've been talking about that give us an opportunity um, to accomplish all of these different proposals. Um, to accomplish facilities that allow us to intervene at the right time in the right place of, a, of an individual that's going through crisis on these types of properties. And here's a scenario that the, 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 the poll results showed, although some were close, and I, and I recognize that. So um, the, 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 the Labounty property, Labounty, uh, Slater, and I-5, you know, just north of the Bellingham Airport um, on the south side of, of, of Ferndale. You, you accomplish a new horizontal jail to replace the existing downtown jail and work center. You include the concepts that Caleb ha have been talking about, Lieut Lieutenant Erickson, on a booking restrict reception, large open area, the medical, and, and that wish list that we've been talking about. You also include a, a behavioral care center um, that is uh, co-located, although yet probably separate from the operations. And the feasibility of being able to build horizontal um, at that location allows for um, the feasibility of both the new jail and the behavioral care center being built at that spot. The Iron Gate Division Street. You, you, we already have the Andy Deacon Center of Hope. Um, the Crisis Stabilization Center. As we just talked about, there's there's three to four acres of, of recently acquired, the county currently owns um, property that you could locate the 24 seven, 23 hour crisis center, um, the behavioral health urgent care facility um, that we've talked about. And then um, you, you, you have the existing work center that could be repurposed into or, or knocked down and rebuilt to Arlene's point 
to into a, a, any other behavioral health um, inpatient, outpatient facility that we could talk about the next step and where it goes. So it gives an opportunity to repurpose that facility as well. You, the, the, the poll results show that Civic Center for holding space uh, associated with transportation of individuals um, from a, a satellite location back to the courthouse so that they can go and, and, and go through courtroom access. Um, there could be an attorney visitation in that facility. So you have more location to the public defender's office um, so that there can be a, a, a visitation either virtually or in person in certain situations. And then also the access to the courtrooms to ensure that they're in those courtroom spaces um, and uh, um, other services as we decide, maybe reentry, uh, maybe maybe other associated could be located um, either on a remodel or an addition of the courthouse. Um, there's been some dialogue about potentially utilizing certain portion or the juvenile detention facility, which is on the sixth floor. There's a lot more that would have to go into that because you'd have to figure out the juvenile detention facility, but that is a, a point that we as a community could talk about. Um, or you could also utilize the, the current jail site um, for that type of um, facility, um, either the existing building or envisioning a new building at that location. And then um, the State Street property, which is actually a Champion Street property, kitty corner to WTA, um, downtown bus station. Um, if we all know, we talked earlier about Way Station at State Street, Walton Place, which is the housing, and there's a vacant property the county owns um, that could be envisioned into this resource center. Leaking the reentry support, allowing for expanded behavioral health service, housing support, vocational support, um, both kind of incarceration um, reentry, as well as uh, maybe some additional support services associated with it. That would have close proximity to the way station and, and the bus station as well. Um, so Holly asked me to be able to present what we found as the highest priorities or highest results in the poll into kind of a, a vision for discussion purposes. So happy to answer any questions and, and hope I was clear in, in, in walking through that with a lot of detail. Thank you, Tyler. Um, I want to mention too, I don't know if you remember in the poll, we also asked people to try and imagine how everything could work together. So that also, in, you know, informed our imagination, I'll say. So um, yeah, so let's let's hear what people's reactions are, suggestions, changes, barrier up. So uh, one overarching thing that this scenario has that's positive is the uh, we really want to look at trauma informed design on everything we do. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the big things about trauma informed design is natural light and a vertical a vertical system a vertical jail does not give you the kinds of opportunities that you can get on a horizontal. Uh, I've been to Skagit, uh, I've been to other facilities in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, and Philadelphia that were vertical and they they had that dingy dark look. Uh, even though Skagit tried to do a few things with some natural lighting, it didn't it didn't permeate the, the facility like what we saw in Nashville with a nice big overhead type of skylight. So uh, I, I think it's important that we that we keep that trauma informed design at, at front of mind, really, for everything that we're building, because it's going to help. It's going to help ease those folks that are incarcerated. It's going to ease some of that the, the tensions they have and and. Uh, some of the colors that you can use are calming. So I think that's something that we really have to take into consideration. Right, thank you. Really? Thank you. Uh, food for thought from the court's perspective. Mm -hmm. I look at this and I think these are great ideas. Um, throughout the pandemic, we got very creative with court. Um, sometimes we couldn't go into the jail and sometimes it was pandemic related and sometimes it was structural challenges. So there was a little bit of both there, but in all of that, we recognize that the jail staff aren't court staff and we don't, 
want them or feel like they should have to fill out court paperwork. We also want to make sure public defense attorneys have adequate space and time with their clients. Sometimes when you have multiple facilities, you have the challenge of somebody from the court trying to handle somebody that might be at the work center and might be at the main, main jail. And so as we look at building something to another location, um, maybe some bigger courts have the ability to do some hearings, not everybody. So that's something that we may want to incorporate as we're looking at expanding and having the ability to do hybrid courts, but we still need to make sure that Defense counsel can be in there and can be able to talk to their clients in a timely, reasonable manner so the courts aren't backed up. The other thing is I'm thinking about therapeutic courts. If we have a center that we're having a behavioral health center and a jail attached, behavioral um, therapeutic courts are usually small personal. They're not set up like a normal courtroom. That's something to be thought of. Um, educational centers, I didn't see that in any of the models. And I know that's something that we've talked about for reentry as imperative. And I know as um, we did have some educational going on prior to some of the other issues at the main jail, and those spaces aren't being able to be utilized like they were. So that's something I, I don't want to lose sight of as we're going forward. Um, and then the language assistance for people that are hard of hearing, um, people that have mentally ill issue, mental ill issues. Um, I know some of the schizophrenic people are a little bit concerned if you decide to do just a hybrid court where they're talking to a camera and they're not sure where the voices are coming from, whether that's in their head or it's on a camera. So there, there's a lot of different things that come from a different perspective that I think we want to make sure we're looking at. And I just kind of wrote those down as we're going through them. So um, if you have any questions or want me to add to it later on, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Yeah, Darlene. I don't, I am so appreciative of all of the work that all everyone has done and the deep dive that everyone has done into all of these areas. Um, I think it's amazing. I never dreamed that our community could come together and do so much positive work. But I'm going back and I'm going to put this out there because I feel like in fairness, I have to. When we listened to the public after the second time when the vote went down, there were three main takeaways that I took. One, they wanted jail alternatives and they wanted alternatives to being incarcerated. And I think we've done a good job on looking for housing, on listening for behavioral health treatment, and we're going down that path. The second thing is they didn't want it in Ferndale. The third thing was that they didn't want it to be the same size as we recommended the first time, which I believe was about somewhere between five and 600 beds. I can't remember exactly what it was. My concern is that while we've been educated and we understand the need for these things and the complication, getting that message to the public who has turned it down twice and two out of those three things that they highlighted are still in our new plan. Um, that is a big concern for me because I feel very strongly that this has to succeed. And so whether that is addressed through the messaging, through the company that we've hired, or however we address it, I do not think that that's something we can lose sight of because it's the public who's going to fund this and they do not have the background that we have the privilege of having. And that message is going to be key because, as I said, I feel like if this goes down the third time, I don't know what we're going to do. We're in trouble. And I'm not saying that to be negative because I'm very appreciative of all that we've done. But I don't think that's something we can lose sight of. Yeah, well spoken. Thanks for naming it, too. I think you've named something we that needs to be said. Yeah. Appreciate it. All right, Dean, and then Caleb and Arlene, and then maybe folks who haven't had a chance to speak yet. Dean, you're up. Yeah, I think as I've listened to people in the community, uh, at least in the circles I travel in, uh, the issue of of trust uh, remains paramount. And I think it's 
largely because of people, different pe people's different visions of what will be the case 20 or 30 years down the road. Um, and on the one hand, there's the notion of, well, we're looking at population projections and, and there'll be growth. And so we'll continue to need the same number of beds. And on the other hand, there's the perspective that says, well, but if we implement these alternatives and these efforts to attack the root causes of poverty and therefore criminal behavior, that we ought to be able in a, in a, in a better world to reduce our use of beds that we lock people up into. And so I think it's gonna be important to develop some frame that describes how would the use of those of beds that we build, let's say that you're you're referring to out in in La Bounty, uh, you know the, the the combination of the standard sort of jail in the you know, security sense and the work center and the behavioral health beds, somehow how to to plan and design into that uh, kind of a facility, how their uses could be moved, could be changed over time and repurposed if we are in fact successful in diverting people from the criminal justice system. I think people would, would have more trust in the plan if they saw that there was thought put into um, uh, the, the possibility that we might have a, a lower demand and a different way we could use those by changing the kinds of programming that goes on in that, in that space. Uh, of course, the other big trust issue is just, well, Will will both sides of the equation occur? On the one hand, we build this building or set of buildings, but on the other hand, uh, we'll get those programs in place as well. And if the buildings get built, but the programs don't grow and and further develop, then I think there's a real trust issue with that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Dean. Caleb. So a couple of things. I think that the trust issue is absolutely paramount, right? We've got to make sure that everybody in our community um, is aware of what's going on, is aware of what options exist. Um, and, you know, certainly bears mentioning that the majority of the people who are involved here in this discussion weren't necessarily the same people that were involved in the previous attempts at this stuff. So there are new ideas, there are new concepts that not only have been um, implemented, but have come to uh, light even in the past you know, six or so years, and that we're already working on implementing for change. Um, I also wanted to mention, because Raylene had some good comments to say about access and access specifically for courts limited jurisdiction within an imagined facility. And uh, I would like to see personally, if we're imagining things that, that um, we can address many of the uh, specific access needs of, a, of the courts of limited jurisdiction, but also really anybody in terms of the public defender and the folks who uh, could potentially come through therapeutic courts. Um, if we had space designed for uh, those needs in a, in a facility, you could have a courtroom or, um, you know, even potentially offices and other spaces like that, that, that court clerks and public defender's office uh, folks could use and utilize to uh, make the whole space function more cohesively, but it's all about access. So we have to have a space set aside and dedicated for those purposes in order to make that access reality. Great, yeah, thank you so much. Really helpful comments, all of you. Arlene? Yeah, um, I I wasn't going to speak about the location of the jail because um, I have a, an opinion about everything and I don't need to express it. But when um, Darlene spoke about listening to the public and made her points, I knew that I needed to say it too, that trust is what Darlene is talking about. If we do not listen to what people are saying to us, they will not trust us. And they're getting ready to resist. So we need to pay attention that they do not want the Labounty property, even though it would have more light and it would be uh, easy to expand. If we want light, we can make big windows. 
that is how you get light in a space too. But what we need is for this measure to pass. And if it doesn't, I agree with Darlene, it's everything that we've dreamed of and wished for and hoped for for our community is not here. So let's listen to what has been said and why it's been said and do what we are being asked to do. Thank you. Scott? Um, I guess I, I really like the plan. It takes a lot of my a lot of the boxes of where I've had concerns in the past. I um I guess speaking to the location a little bit, uh it shows growth for 30 to 50 years. And if our as Arlene just stated, if if so many of the items in this proposal work in terms of programs and program space. I just think we owe it to our county too to offer growth for the future. And I just think that we're going to be boxed in if we go to Iron Gate I, and it's vertical, which would probably be more uh, costly to do and, and to build and to operate. I think the plan looks very good. I think since 2017, when this last went to the electorate, you know, times have changed. I think we've tried to limit people going to jail and we've suffered the consequences in a variety of areas. And I think that might change some of the electorate to review and and look at this uh, new plan as yes it's similar to the old plan but now we have more uh, data from what happens if we don't build a new jail and we as a group of citizens have come together and studied this really in depth now for months and this this is probably the best plan um, and then it as I think somebody already mentioned it's probably really up to us too to be out there and to educate the public why this is the best plan so um, I I see this as um, a plan that's workable feasible it's going to be expensive but it ticks a lot of the boxes for everybody and we're just going to have to be compromises on everybody's part to pay for it to have the size and space that we need and to take care of the uh, the people in our criminal justice system. Thank you. Bill? I just wanted to, that we don't lose sight of the fact that the factors that affect jail populations are very fluid. And I'm glad we're addressing the behavioral health issues and, and planning for that. There's other things that are beyond our control, and they're often unpredictable, as we've seen, as I've seen happen over my time as sheriff. What affects the jail population? One of them is changing laws. Uh, one thing may be decriminalized; a new thing is criminalized. Uh, the, the terrible crisis the state has allowed to uh, build with the respect to competency and restoration evaluations and treatment that's really impacted our jail population to an extent we wouldn't have predicted just a few years ago uh, and i'm sure there's also changes in the behavioral health field will there be new ways new types of facilities i was going to say in the history of whatcom county the jail has been at seven different locations it's moved seven different times and I think in, we're looking at the long term, we have to have a site that's adequate to accommodate uh, future jail construction if, if and when it's needed. Hopefully it's not needed, but if it is, we don't want to have, a, we'll all be too old to be sitting here or we'll be dead in 30 years trying to figure this out again. So I, I would hope in the long range planning that we'd, uh, we'd be able to have a site uh, for the same reasons that Scott mentioned. And I also don't want to lose sight also of what I consider the Iron Gate site. I, I really see that as a inconvenience, uh, maybe a difficulty or a challenge for the small law enforcement agencies, particularly those out in the eastern part of the county, uh, having to come all the way into, uh, you know, into Bellingham again. It would be much better if it was located somewhere outside the, the city core, easy access to I-5 where officers could drop people off and get back out uh, onto the street. And I know there's factors uh, for convenience with the public defenders and the courts, but there's also factors of convenience for law enforcement. So just wanted to add that and thank you for the time. Thank you, Bill. 
Okay, I see a couple more hands and just to let people know, we, we still have quite a bit to go in the funding discussion. So let's see if we can keep our comments brief and then see if we, you know, we're gonna have to noodle on this. So it's okay to noodle on it. We're not making a decision today. We're just trying to get a sense of, of what might be possible. So um, yeah, Raylene, you're up. Um, I just think that things have changed so much since it went to the public from the last time, as Bill just mentioned, and that as long as we're educating the public and we're asking them what they want when it is put on the ballot, um, on where maybe they want it and why we're looking at two different locations, I think that's that might help rather than saying one location is out of the question. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah, Brian? Just wanted to address some of the comments around maybe lack of trust um, that it strikes me that what we've spent a great deal of time, uh, whether it was in this group or talking about the stakeholder advisory committee, um, spent a lot of time talking about everything but the jail, that there has been a tremendous number of conversations around the alternatives offered about other paths, pathways to incarceration, about the things that we need to do and should do to prevent uh, folks from being incarcerated. And so um, I guess what I'm trying to say is, I think if we were just trying to build a single jail facility, none of this is happening. It would probably be much easier to choose any one of the sites, but because we are committed uh, to um, the vast number of different, uh, whether it's a behavioral health center or, uh, you know, like the the, uh, the crisis facility, all of those things require us, I think, to think a little bit differently about how do we provide those services. And it feels like it necessitates that we need these multiple sites. So um, I just wanted to flag that um, I think the process that, that a bunch of us have been in and some certainly more than I have over the last, gosh, couple of years, I think um, really shows that we are listening and we are having a incredibly transparent process. And uh, I just wanted to thank Tyler for walking out that plan. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Michael? Yeah, Brian kind of had a, a nice lead in. We're, we're talking about multiple programs and facilities, and therefore also multiple locations, or at least co-location combinations. I think that's a messaging complexity but it's also a selling point. It indicates we're taking a systemic and comprehensive approach. So Brian's right. If you just have to cite one facility, it's a simple, it's a simpler procedure. We're talking about numerous things, so it's complex. But again, I think that's a selling point because it 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 lets the community know we've looked broadly and there are these many pieces and they go together. And so you've got to take the package or at least understand that we're trying to offer a package. Um, I do want to niggle on the old tall buildings somehow aren't don't have good lighting. If you've ever been in a skyscraper, there are some of the brightest buildings you've ever been around. If you've ever been into a warehouse, there's a lot of dark insides. Really good design can overcome the lighting problem. And it also, I think, with all due respect, uh, Sheriff Elfo, if you're coming in the Mount Baker Highway, I think Iron Gate is just as close or more convenient than coming downtown. So um, Iron Gate is actually a pretty darn good location uh, access-wise for the members of our community who are out in the county. Thank you. So I'm going to have Saw Paul uh wind it up for us here and then we're gonna have to transition so scott you're gonna have to forgive me here softball okay. uh, very, very, quickly, here. very quickly i was reading the documents from 2010 mm -hmm. that when a similar group of people 30 40 people spent a year and they had 13 property options 13 property options within bellingham and vicinity we have only two or three and end point was after their one year of discussion, I, if you read the arguments were not very different than what we are having. And they recommended uh, that place and that current, uh, that uh, uh, administration went ahead and invested the money to do that because that was their best choice at that time. That's all, thank you. Yeah. 
Well, and, and so Paul, you said something at the last, at the end of our last meeting that I think was just so helpful, which is, so here are the, here's the property we have, let's use all of them and let's use each, all four of them to best advantage. And that, I think that was really helpful for our process when you, when you laid that out. So I think, I think that, um, and Michael, this really connects to your last point too, you know, that we are, you know, how we're communicating about it and also how we're thinking about it is different than it was before. And just to acknowledge the fact that the, you know, the, you know, the public relations and that trust is going to be critical and how we communicate and how we help, um, you know, got to see how it's going to go. So here we are now and we're ready. Everybody, if you need to stand up right now and like breathe or stretch, we've got 45 minutes and we have like a fire hose full of content about money. Okay. You ready? Here we go. It's going to be really fun. But if you have to like turn off your camera and stretch for a minute, now's your moment. Tyler, you're up. Here we go. Money. What, what if I'm not ready? <laughs> <laughs> Jump. Oh, you're not ready. Right. Yeah. No, no, ready. No, no, oh, I'm joking. I'm, I, 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 I'll be ready. <laughs> I was born ready. Go ahead. You're on. Yep. Um, so, so uh, just, just, just. one of the one of the conversations that we've been having, and and just is just a reconfirmation that um, the county is um, hiring a cost estimator. It's a construction cost estimator um, to kind of answer that community question about what does it cost um, for horizontal jail facilities compared to vertical jail facilities, because that'll be a mid part of this community dialogue about this community. Um, decision making. Um, the, the the component that I want to recognize there is when I've started to think about it. There's going there's only certain types of funding sources that are available for to uh, to the county for the construction for the capital part of the facility. The the the, the more money we can save on the capital facility. Which is likely going to be a horizontal, but I, I, I will let the cost estimators come out. The more money there is for the services that we're talking about, for the behavioral health expansions that we're talking about. So just keep that context in mind as we're talking about site locations and horizontal versus vertical as it relates to the capital cost. So the county is going to get um, a, a cost estimate for a horizontal jail facility for a vertical jail facility of the same size. Um, for the crisis relief center at the Iron Gate facility. And then we've also um, asked for some discussion about what would the cost be to remodel the work center if that was a, a, a component to it. So that, that'll be informing the um, final implementation plan. Um, one, one component that you see from the implementation plan, um, Heather pointed out one, the draft plan doesn't have who's going to implement the steps and we're going to be working on that. And then the draft plan doesn't also have a, a cost understanding of it. And so this information will inform that final or next draft of the implementation plan and should take about three weeks or so to, to get that information. One caveat, it's a real high level preliminary um, cost estimate, because as, as people know, in the construction trade, you kind of have 30%, 60%, 90% design. Um, what we have right now is square footage and ideas of construction method and where it goes to, to put that information together. So I think this is the funding workshop, which means I think we get an opportunity to talk about potential funding sources. Um, so um, as we look to um, the SAC process, uh, there, there, there's clear there's some high level of, of agreement among the SAC members and the community members. One, there's a desire to protect public health, safety, and the rights. Uh, two, have a jail facility that is structurally sound, well designed to ensure safety of the, the people, the staff, and the visitors and large enough to meet the community public safety needs and to accommodate the needed services surrounding it. And then three, improve the service capacity and availability in the areas of behavioral health, mental health, and substance abuse treatment. Uh, 
from the, the justice project needs assessment, the SAC has not set a priority, order of addressing the needs and the recommendations. Um, as we were talking earlier, when we were looking at importance and feasibility, um, some of the needs and recommendations are urgent, but they all must be addressed over time. Uh, kind of recognizing the discussion um, from Arlene, it, 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 there was four different high priority, high feasibility behavioral health, those all must be addressed. Um, and, and as that looks, and as I've talked in the past, kind of identifying a, 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 a one year to three year and then a six year implementation plan and how, how we've looked in the past. So as funding opportunities arise, um, priorities can be addressed associated with how the plan is laid out and, and where those priorities are. And it's really something that the county council has asked and Barry can kind of confirm that, that the council is asking for a, a, a priority uh, implementation plan with funding attached to to how how to accomplish them. So in the SAC, um, compliments to um, uh, Kathy Holka and myself uh, and and others in the in the county and and different. We kind of identified potential funding sources. Um, it's a document that I don't think has been sent out, and I would request Holly and 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 Marty to send kind of that attachment out um, for or additional review by this group. Um, but it was a really well done matrix that identifies um, the different funds, both locally, um, state, federal, um, that can be utilized for criminal justice, jail purposes, for behavioral health purposes, uh, and a number of different local community needs, that what we've tried to do is pull from that document and, and include into this PowerPoint, into this discussion, some specific ones for each part of the recommendations, right? We're going to have a criminal justice jail facility recommendation. We're going to have a, a, a behavioral health recommendation, which we'll get to here soon. And there is also the housing discussion and recommendations. So what we wanted to do for the members today was to highlight what's in the stakeholder needs assessment from a funding standpoint and how it could relate to some of the projects so that we can get your guys' feedback and input so we can incorporate that into the final implementation plan um, on some, some funding sources. So jail projects, uh, there is, um, as, as many of you on this know, and, and others may not, there's a Whatcom County Jail Fund that is an operating fund that the county utilizes, um, utilizing general fund, uh, city municipal per diems, uh, other revenue sources to operate the jail facility. Um, we keep that with a with a balance, uh, but we don't. Um, we we it's really just an operating fund associated with it. Uh, there is a health and safety justice facility fund uh, that was um, formerly known as the New Jail Fund, uh, with the effort from the council um, to really look into the health, the safety, the justice surrounding the project. It has been renamed, and 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 that is a a capital fund that the county has to accomplish. Um, the capital project, the initial stages of the capital project, um, architectural engineering, planning, uh, this community dialogue and the consultants associated with it. Uh, and there is recently, not on this list because this list was developed in, in last summer, uh, the county council has created a capital reserve fund uh, that currently has uh, uh, about six, $6.5, $6.9 million for capital needs uh, that the county has. It can be utilized for these facilities that we've been talking about. Um, in this discussion, we've had a lot of conversations about potential ballot measures. Those potential ballot measure conversations have been tied to a public safety tax uh, levy associated with it. Um, Projects may vary in there, but currently the county 
um, and the cities collect one third, one tenth, and there are two tenths available. Uh, and, and that, of course, requires county council approval to place on the ballot measure, similar to what we what the county has done the last two measures that that, that have failed. So I can get more into detail on that. Um, there is a slide at the next one, uh, but I think um, what I would like to do is, is uh, just provide that information. Uh, the slides will be coming out to the group for you all to review and understand. And then we can ask some additional questions if people have an interest in kind of hearing the details of that tax initiative. Um, you know, the, the behavioral health um, service funding, um, Erica is on the call. Erica uh, is on the call and can talk a little bit about the behavioral health fund, um, AKA the, 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 the sales tax associated with it. Um, the county council in the, in the middle 2000s was able to um, move forward with the behavioral health, which helps fund drug court, family treatment, behavioral health units, uh, mental health court, those therapy courts that we've been talking about. Um, it does uh, provide some dollars to operate uh, housing and community mental and behavioral health services. Um, a lot of the psych services, the medical in the jail um, is, is provided um, from the behavioral health fund. Um, and recently, um, some ongoing support for, for the GRACE program and, and others. Um, there's an amount of money that comes in from the mental health millage. Uh, and a couple of other sources that all kind of provide the behavioral health. Uh, I would say, and I'll let Erica speak more if she'd like, in general, uh, the local behavioral health dollars, there is some, some capital reserves in that fund uh, that would allow us to use some local funds to leverage the state funds that we're, that we're going after for the uh, crisis care center, or or maybe for the behavioral resource center, um, maybe even for the behavioral care center of the of the new um, facility. Uh, so there is some capital dollars that we could utilize. Uh, the ongoing operations; those funds are pretty taxed. They're they're pretty stretched. So so this is an opportunity through a public safety tax uh, to accomplish some additional expansion into criminal justice and the component of the behavioral health system that we've been talking about, if we um, can figure out that, that detail. So um, the, the, the next slide there um, just recognizes kind of uh, a, a higher level regional funding source that's in that uh, document, the North Sound BHO, AS, BHASO, um, and, and different funds that um, come through the index Integrated managed care model um, through the state um, that helps provide um, some of that sources. Perry Mowry and others, and, and, and Councilmember Buchanan are, are on that board. Um, it is opportunities for us as we've talked to look to for additional uh, funding sources for, for some of the, the work that we're looking into or the regional facilities that we're um, accomplishing. And then uh, Lastly, uh, we, of course, have the, the, the housing components, the funding sources with, for, for housing. Um, the, most of these housing funds are similar in their restrictions and in, in how and what they can um, develop. Uh, Bellingham has, for many years, had the Bellingham Home Fund, um, has been very successful in building um, supportive, affordable housing um, projects. Uh, recently, Whatcom County Council, right, with the executive support, has, has moved forward with um, House Bill 1590 and Senate Bill 1406, which is the Affordable Housing Supportive Housing Fund and the Housing Related Services Fund. So those are countywide funds to help provide support for the housing components. Um, look who those to, um, to, 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 to maybe be able to leverage them for the, the housing projects. Um, a couple components to that, we haven't identified exactly what those housing projects look like. Um, we've kind of talked about two different examples. We've talked about CityGate 
as an example, a larger apartment building with, with case management associated with it. And we've talked about Sunhouse as an example, more of a, a smaller, um, specially sheltered. Uh, the, the, the larger facilities are, are easier to leverage local dollars to get um, capital dollars in to accomplish. Um, the smaller, like Sun House, do have more of an operating cost associated with them um, compared, compared to how many people are, we are utilizing. So that's just something that, to keep in mind. Um, I would say from a housing standpoint, we are very good as a community to accomplish those new housing projects. Um, so, you know, connecting this group's conversation on supportive housing into the, the network of, of affordable supporting housing um, committees that Mike Parker that talked earlier and others are on is a really good next step um, to see where that can go and how that gets accomplished. And then the last component is, is working with the regional and state partners to increase our resources, um, which is the next slide. Uh, we've talked about leveraging the, the $9 million that hopefully will be in the, the final um, Olympiads budget, the, the legislation budget for the 23-hour, uh, 24-7 uh, urgent care crisis relief center, um, whatever we, we, we decide to define that uh, moving forward. We're very um, um, hopeful that that $9 million will be there. That's an example of leveraging this community's dialogue into state funds on projects that have um, benefit throughout the community and the region. Um, we also need to look to the legislation um, similar to Senate Bill 5120, uh, which is the, the operating side of those types of facilities uh, to establish, uh, you know, uh, ho hopefully allowing Medicaid billing for those types of facilities because um, we won't be able to, as a community, operate, have funding enough to operate that type of facility, we will really need to leverage the Medicaid dollars. So there's a good example of the leverage statewide and the regional partners. Uh, so, you know, overall, I think what we wanted to do was just to provide a, a high level connection into the funding matrix that is already in the needs assessment. Um, specifically talk about opportunities that we may have and as more details come out to the implementation plan, we will be identifying um, people to implement those projects as well as funding that is available or needed for those projects consistent with the funding sources that we know. Um, so I think now is an opportunity to kind of point out maybe other potential funding sources that we should know about um, and a discussion about um, what projects the, 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 the task force feels should definitely be part of a, a future tax initiative um, to a public safety tax to accomplish um, what we're all been talking about. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Tyler, that was excellent. You just made a lot of information. <laughs> really, really well done, really clear. So let's stay, let's actually start with um, if there's pieces that people want to add on uh, to what Tyler just described that you think would be helpful. Like Erica, I don't know if there were things you wanted to help clarify about the funding or, or Kayla, I think you had also mentioned you might have some details. So I just want to start with either, if either of you have something you'd like to add into the picture. I think I'm comfortable just answering questions if folks have them about the fund rather than providing more information. There's a lot here. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> there is a lot. Uh, okay. Kayla, anything from you? To say? Yeah, same. I, I feel like Tyler covered it really well and just wanted to open it up for questions and, and yeah, here to support just like Erica is. Terrific. Okay. Thank you. Scott? So this kind of dovetails into maybe my previous comment as well, but I just, what I heard Tyler say in his presentation, which was excellent, was the emphasis on the lower the cost for the facility, the more money will be left for services. And I just want to emphasize that so that, I mean, if if we, and I 
I pivot to the Iron Gate, which will likely be a vertical jail. We'll try to keep our tax or try to keep our costs down. And to keep the cost down, we're going to try to spread it out because the higher you go, the more it's going to cost. But I've, as I've said in this group numerous times, this is something we need for the next 50 years. If we build it and we can't grow it up or out, we're committed for the next whatever to this location. And that's why I keep pivoting back to the bounty. Uh, it'll be hopefully a lower cost to start with, and then we'll have money available for the programs that we all know we need. Thank you. Yeah, that was a really, that was a great point. Hey, what else? So general thoughts about funding, um, other thoughts you have about resources? Let's just stay, uh, stay on that first question first. Or just your impressions when you see all of this. Yeah, Arlene. Well, I'd really like to see us uh, consult with people who have done what we're attempting to do and uh, use their already um, uh, uh, achieved knowledge and experience, um, let's do that. Let's reach out in two communities that have done some of this work. Uh, there may be some in Washington state, but I know there are some in California. And then of course, you've got um, uh, the uh, that Nashville group that has accomplished so much. Um, and if they were able to do it, Let's find out how. So what what would we learn from them? If we, So for groups that have done this more comprehensive approach, and then we learn sort of how they approached funding, is that is that what you're thinking? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Got it. Thank you. Tyler? Yeah, I was just going to, um, it, it's a great point, Arlene. Um, I know that Kayla and myself have, have reached out to um, Connections Health who is um, working on the, the King County Crisis Relief Center um, that is in the legislation for a capital allocation as well. Uh, because one of the components with that is we need to get a much better sense of how Medicaid is used and, and how it can be utilized for the operations associated with it. Um, so we'll be able to report back um, when we get more details on that. And then also to the Nashville perspective, I know that Melora um, and others have had an opportunity this week, I think actually on Tuesday, um, to talk further with the mental health co-op um, who is operating the crisis stabilization, sobering center and respite center there in um, Nashville. And a lot of that was to figure out the operating components and the funding components associated with it. So we don't have the information to present but today, but we do um, recognize that that's a really big component to it. Right. Thank you. Michael? I'm wondering if someone could tell me about um, bonding and borrowing opportunities. This is not just one big capital project, but maybe several. The city was looking at an even larger capital project, believe it or not, a sewage treatment plant. And we had access to a WIFI loan program, a federal loan program for huge loans. This is a program nationally that funds billion dollar projects. Does the county have access to low interest funding vehicles um, that, that what, what's the access on the borrowing side? If, if, um, if I may, uh, Tyler will add more to that. Uh, I think that uh, <clears throat> we have already approved some money for our trailer to hire a consultant to do this job. We have been proactive. This is uh, uh, that we know this is going to come to us. So we started this process six months ago to know what the lay of the land is, what interest rates are doing, what are the opportunities, what are the other uh, opportunities are. I don't think uh, we have right now uh, in, in our knowledge what those are. One of the thing is that uh, uh, working with all the cities together and the county that internally, that how we can work together 
and do some savings, which may be not a whole lot of substantial, but they can be uh, uh, critical for us to do this. As interest rates are rising, I don't think we'll go back to uh, zero or 1% interest rates in future. And, uh, and this is about the sharing formula. I think that uh, the cities have been very responsive and uh, practical and, and, uh, and working with the county. But those things are in the process of which can save us several million dollars uh, in this whole process. We were thinking of this that far that when we had the CARES Act dollars, this is, I'm talking 2020, we were able to maneuver uh, uh, some savings which we have put in that uh, uh, Tyler mentioned as uh, capital facilities fund. That's almost $6.3 million. And we knew that we're gonna need that for this kind of need. And, and that's another uh, money we have saved. So uh, yes, we are working on it very proactively. Thank you. All right, thank you. Scott? Yeah, I've worked with Tyler a little bit on the finances, but I, I, to Michael's point, uh, borrowing the money is one thing which we will be doing. I guess, how are you gonna pay for it? You gotta pay it back. And that that's the question is, I think we can find lots of pots where we can borrow money. Maybe we could borrow it at a low interest rate if we find the right pot. But the, the real question is, how do you pay it back if you're borrowing money? And that's where this two tenths covers that debt load for the for the foreseeable future. So um, unless we could find grants, which which would be even better yet in my mind. But if we're going to borrow money, the question isn't borrowing it. The question is, how do we pay it back? Yeah, thank you. Tom? Yeah, and just a little bit more um, um, details on where Executive Sidhu is recognized. Um, the county has contracted with PFM. Um, it's a financial consultant um, that provides municipal um, bond rating, capital rating, and um, bond capacity. Um, and, and we are meeting with them in the next few weeks to specifically talk about um, what that looks like what an anticipated interest would be, what the capital and bond payment is, um, which will help inform the public safety tax if that's what is, is moved forward to, because Mayor Scott's point, um, that would be the revenue source to pay back the bond and anything above that bond payment then becomes available to the city and the counties, the county and the cities to accomplish the, the the, the criminal justice behavioral health services that we are talking about in this implementation plan. I do have a slide that talks a little bit more about the public safety tax. I thought it would be a little bit too much into the weeds for today. I'm happy to talk through it if, if the group thinks that that would uh, be helpful. What do you guys think? Do you want to see it? I think I think maybe you should show it. Tyler, just because I feel like what we're doing right now is just like, here's the information we have. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, and then we'll have it. Yeah, go ahead. If, so is that that, can put the slides back up. Um, this is slide 32. Yep, the potential uh, income from a, a tax initiative. Um, so uh, I've been having some conversations that the, the, the mayors um, over the last couple of months um, have uh, identified Mayor Scott and, and Brian Heinrich at the city of Bellingham to kind of talk through a framework. Um, this is RCW 82-14-450, uh, which is the similar um, from the last couple of um, public safety, public sales tax initiatives. Um, it allows three tenths of sales tax um, for counties and cities. Currently, as I indicated, we collect one tenth already, two thirds of that goes to the EMS program, one third of that goes to criminal justice in our community. Um, in 2021, one tenth collected about $5.3 million. In 2022, uh, one tenth collected $5.99 million, so almost $6 million. Uh, we have seen a considerable growth in sales tax collection in the, after the COVID years, after 2021 to the tune of 10 to 13% a year, um, which we don't think will always continue, but it, it, it has um, some benefits. There has been some tax structure that has changes where we think that might be from 
um, delivery from real estate or from internet purchases. So very preliminary projections for 210 would be in the third, the 12 to 13 million dollar range. Um, this type of sales tax measure would require a, a majority uh, for community vote, so 50 plus one. The RCW indicates that the ballot measure must clearly state the purpose for which the sales tax will be used. But I think all intents and purposes, this implementation planning effort um, will inform the county council's decision about what is included in the ballot measure. And, and that's really the, the value of this conversation and the additional behavioral health components. Um, that are included in this discussion and was in the past. Um, a component to it is one third of the sales tax must be used for criminal justice purposes, fire protection, or both. Uh, but as we have been talking or proposing, if we were to use the two tenths for paying off the bond, that's clearly over the one third needed for criminal justice purposes. And so any money that's not needed to pay off the bond uh, from the county would be then utilized uh, for the purposes that were in the sale in, in the in the in the ballot measure, um, as we've been talking about in this implementation plan um, for criminal justice, behavioral health facilities and services associated with it. The, 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 the state law talks about a share between the county and the city. So the two tenths collects about 12 to $13 million a year. Of that two tenths, of that $13 million, 60% of it by state law comes to the county, 40% of that goes to the cities. Uh, so there does need to be, and there will be discussion between the counties and all the cities in Whatcom County on interlocals that are in place about modifying that 60-40 split um, to be able to accomplish the, the facility construction as well as ensure we're all on the same page of maybe an oversight board uh, to those dollars um, and how the services associated with the implementation plan get carried out. Um, so that is a component that Mayor Scott, uh, Brian and myself actually met about this morning and have met for the last couple of months following this stakeholder advisory committee uh, with the RCW and the interlocal in mind to be consistent with this discussion. And Great. If anybody wants to talk about just one other piece. Um, we don't know what interest rates are currently, Council Member Lilliquist. Uh, they're not 2% like they were in, in 2015. They're more like three and a half to four and a half percent. So to accomplish um, about 130 to $150 million bond, if that's what the capital component is, uh, that takes approximately uh, eight, $8.3 million of that $13 million that's coming in to accomplish that capital component. So there is, if that's approximately the bond, some additional dollars that are coming in that we'd be able to accomplish some of the other expansions that we're talking about above and beyond the jail construction. That was, I'm really glad you mentioned that last part. Um, that was great, Tyler. And this is really, really important information, I think. So uh, Jack and Caleb and Michael. Thank you, Tyler. That was great. Um, I don't remember the year. Approximately 10 years ago when we did the one-tenth behavioral health uh, revenue uh, effort, the council approved it four to three. I, I was our first chair. And I remember part of the success in that is sales taxes are often somewhat legitimately, legitimately criticized for being regressive or disproportionately affecting people of lower income. However, in Whatcom County, because of our unique geographic location, a certain percentage of our sales revenue comes from outside the county, specifically Canadian and other shoppers. I do remember that that was part of a um, successful advocacy for a sales tax in Whatcom County. It would encourage 
uh, the administration and others to look into that. I don't. I, I believe we had a challenge determining what that number was, but we were able to make some estimates. And I remember feeling better about a sales tax in the context of Whatcom County, given the nature of who pays that sales tax. So I wanted to throw that in. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. Caleb? I just want to make sure I understood this correctly. It looks like what we're laying out here would cover bonding for capital improvement costs, but is this also structured to cover operational costs for a facility? Because I think that depending on how you build it, uh, operational costs could far exceed the $12 million per year or even the combined $18 million per three-tenths. Yeah, so um, yes, it can be used for operations as well. Um, we have the current Whatcom County Jail Fund that is used for operations. Um, a number of multitude of, of revenue sources. I'm going to say the number, but people are going to commit me to that number, so I will need to look at how much that is. Somewhere between 16 to $17 million a year that will continue to be available to operate. So Caleb, your point is, is super valid. There needs to be a discussion about capital and about operations. Um, there is current revenue sources between the county and the cities and ever that help the current operations and, and, and fund those current operations. There may be, of course, an increase of that operational cost, you know, especially if we build a behavioral care center um, especially if we expand the medical component of the jail, which is currently done, as you know better than others, Caleb, in a, a very small area, and we want to make it more appropriately designed, trauma-informed, legitimate for construction, there may be increases in that cost. So yes, we could utilize the public safety tax for some of that purpose. We would need to utilize the Whatcom County Jail Fund and the other funding sources that we currently have in the community for that purpose. Uh, but if you look at an $8 million capital bond, a $13 million collection, what I wanted to recognize is that there is some room for us to utilize that public safety tax for these behavioral health and expansions of services, whatever they decide to be in this plan. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, Michael. I won't spend too much time on that because it was exactly the question that Kayla brought up and then Tyler just addressed. Um, but I want to address it kind of even more positively. We should plan and expect and set aside and budget for some part of any funding mechanism, new funding mechanism, ballot measure to go towards increased operations, particularly for behavioral health services, which may be new and, you know, which may be new. So it's, it's almost like the other way around. It's almost like we should try to subtract our operational costs and then look what's left over. And, and I understand uh, Scott's point that you gotta, you gotta worry about paying it back, but you, know, you, you look at interest rates too, and you can kind of figure out how much house you can afford by looking at interest rates and what you can afford on a month to month basis. And it, and it really kind of constrains you and put you inside a shell, but I think to, we really have to start out by trying to properly earmark or set aside operational costs, right? That that needs to come first or or at the same time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank uh, you, Michael. I, I was going to add on to what Michael just said is that, Michael, this has been uh, on our mind all along. And uh, our expectation is is that if we have a single place, like we have two different places and the way our current jails, jails are, uh, we expect there will be some savings in our overall operational cost as compared to, of course, cost will increase over next 20 years, but our base cost should be more uh, efficient and, and any savings that we can have uh, that will be diverted towards the other uh, things which you are thinking, planning, and uh, and promising to our our, our citizens, uh, like the behavioral health, mental health. So definitely, that is a big factor. Thank you. Thank you, Sapal. 
Okay, anything else? All right. Well, what I'm really noticing today is that we have all of these different pieces we're trying to put together. We need the spaces, we need the people to run the programs and make sure that we have um, this can deliver the services. Um, we need policy work and we really need to um, make sure that we have the coordination and the accountability and the messaging and the communications to, to bring it all together. So it's feeling like we're right at this place where the pieces are starting, just beginning to shuffle around a little bit and um, start to come into form. So mostly I just wanna say how, uh, really how impressed I am with everybody's thoughtful comments today. I think it was, and how respectfully you disagree when you disagree. And also the hard work that people are putting in, like, you know, Barry and Tyler and, um, you know, Jack and Stephen have just put so many hours into this. So, um, and Caleb, I could go on and list a bunch of you here who've just really been putting in so much time to bring all of this information together. I'm just super, super impressed and grateful. And uh, I also want to do a shout out for Kathy for just her keen ability to flip those slides at the right minute. I don't know if you guys are watching this, but like the minute we open it up to discussion, the slides disappear. It's like magic. She's really good at her job. So let's hear it for Kathy. Thank you. Really excellent, excellent work. So uh, I think we're just about to write it up or wrap it up. Sorry. And uh, last slides could go up right now. I, I'm sure you might have more thoughts after this meeting because we just laid out a lot of information. And so please do email uh, if you have have remaining thoughts. We we have more to go, obviously. So next steps. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Yep. Okay. So we have more sessions coming up with the IPRTF and the Law and Justice Council. We've got more conversations with county council. And remember, we still also have the public input to go. So um, we need to be thinking about the kinds of input we're going to be getting from people and how that can inform our work together. Uh, so next slide, we're going to just connect on those points. Yeah. Yep. Focus groups, April 24th and 28th, and then the town hall on May 24th. So if you all have uh, folks who you think would be great for focus groups, um, looking especially for communities of color, folks who have been previously incarcerated and their families, um, that'd be great. And also if you can be there for the town hall, that would be, I think, super. And uh, so if you can get that on your calendar and invite people to come. It's just, we really want to make sure to use this next phase of the work, both in gathering the more, in, more information, as Tyler had described, on the money side of it, but also on the public input side of it. So, um, yeah, this is going to be another interesting leg to our journey, I think. Uh, Wendy, yeah, you had one more comment? Just a quick question. Um, for yeah. the regular task force meetings, do mm -hmm. is it the desire that Kind of the rest of us that are not officially on the task force show up for those meetings if we're going to be focusing on this project or you would just let us know if you needed us to be there uh jack would you are you there do you want to speak to that i am here in yeah i think absolutely it'd be great if you're the task force and historically um Within the context of what we're allowed to do, we have made sure that people can participate where appropriate. Um, it's it's a little bit of a fine line because, as you well know, with 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 open public meetings. But yeah, we would absolutely encourage you to be there. Especially you, Wendy. You always have good stuff. You know. Great. Okay. Good. Anything else before we close out? We can let you all know who aren't on the IPRTF what when on the agendas we'll be talking about this justice project work in the in those IPRTF meetings. Yeah. Good. So Paul? I just wanted to say that last night come to council meeting very did a good job to to apprise them where we are. And I think one of the discussion point came up was the uh, time frame for county council would like that they should not be squeezed when time comes to for them to make the final decision. I just wanna, and Barry has a good handle on it. I just wanted to remind everybody else 
that our timeline is pretty tight and more and more people we can get involved or bring it to this town hall uh, and, uh, and get a good perspective on that would be very helpful. Uh, maybe Barry, you wanna add something to that? Yeah, I will. And just as we close out, I, I will be bringing something to the planning team that's going to be new and exciting um, and related to council. So uh, I will be sending you out an email in, a, in a, an hour or so just outlining that. And um, But I wanted to utmostly thank you all again for being here. Uh, this has been a, a lot of hard work, a lot of great work. Um, and it couldn't have happened without all of you. So uh, again, thanks. And uh, we will see you on the trail. We're adjourned. Thank you.